With that, I'd like to thank all of our panelists. I believe that our lunch is ready. And you should go ahead and get your lunch, come back to the tables, and we'll reconvene in about 30 to 45 minutes. So that we can finish our conference, get your last piece of cake for the day. I am very pleased to be able to say that our, our next speaker, Leon Firth, is the former National Security Advisor to Vice President Al Gore. Following 11 years as a Foreign Service Officer, Professor Firth joined then Congressman Gore's staff as Senior Legislative Assistant for National Security focusing on issues of arms control and strategic stability. As the Vice President's National Security Advisor, President Firth served simultaneously on the Deputies and Principals Committees of the National Security Council, alongside the Secretary of State, the Secretary of Defense, and the President's own National Security Advisor. After retiring from government service at the conclusion of the Clinton administration, Professor Firth came to the George Washington University Elliott School of International Affairs and leads the project on forward engagement. Professor Firth holds a bachelor's degree in English and a master's degree in history from New York University, as well as a master's degree in public administration from Harvard. It is my great honor to introduce my friend, mentor, and colleague, Professor Leon Firth, who will talk about the next steps uniting foresight and policy in governance. Leon. Okay. Oh, boy. Um, Yeah. Told you that there's a lag while well, well, the words assemble themselves on some marshalling line. Topic that I picked, um, uniting foresight and policy and governance, really now reverts back um, to bracket many of the questions that came up. Where would you put it? Would it be brick and mortars? Um, you know, how responsive to the politically hot issues of the day would it be? How would it be relevant if you successfully separated it from the sexiest issues um, that confront an administration? Um, all these sorts of things, which I don't intend to get into. Um, I'm going to stress certain very basic ideas um, one of those ideas is that um, we need to do this. We need to find a way um, to organize foresight uh, into the output of a system. Okay, and we need to find a way to involve the output of that system in the way that our national policy is made. And not as an afterthought not as something that you sort of plug into the, the thing at the very end of the process, but as something that is plugged into the system at the front end, the middle, and the back end um, of the process. Um, and uh, you're going to have to find a way to figure out how to do this in a very difficult political climate. 
And you're going to have to make decisions about um, you know, whether you can afford to wait until the Congress will enable it by a massive new piece of, re of uh, legislation or whether there are ways to begin to do it uh, and hopefully in the process begin to bring the Congress along uh, with some changes of its own that might make it um, a richer experience for members of the legislative body than they now have uh, and which could gradually build towards the point where we might hope um, that the proposition that we need deep reform in the government um, could be entertained in a way that permits um, political forces to reach agreement and compromise, which of course is not the way in which the system currently operates. Um, and so I think I want to talk about those, um, uh, those elements. By the way, um, as, a, as a teacher, um, I use my graduate students as, um, <clears throat> as a learning device for me. After I, after I did my best to teach my students each semester how to think in this mode, um, I then presented them with a series, semester by semester, of things that I wanted them to think about that would try, that would possibly begin to answer questions that I was interested in myself. Uh, and you can find their papers. Um, I'll give you the website. www.forwardengagement, as one word, .org. And Evan, if you go uh, into that, where would you look? Graduate seminar. Graduate seminar. And what you would look for would be the collection of semester papers, which each class did collectively after we had finished their, you know, about two-thirds of the, of the semester. Um, and it's interesting because the very first scenario I wrote for them 10 years ago um, said you have a president-elect who sends a letter um, to his chief of staff saying the United States is at the very zenith of its powers, but there could be things out there that we are not watching that could catch us unprepared. And I'm not really satisfied that we have a system that's capable of catching that. And I'd like a wise, a wise person's panel um, to prepare for me an idea of what some of these forces might be, uh, and also to suggest ways to improve governance so that it has a better chance of detecting them uh, at an early moment. And then successive classes begin to examine the different modalities. So you will find a paper in there. Um, that looks at umpteen different ways to organize foresight inside of the executive branch, including the question of whether it should be a Dulles to insulate it from uh, White House politics or inside the White House compound, should it be virtual or should it be brick and mortar, all those things. And these are well done discussions. You'll also find a discussion of how to create a foresight cycle in Congress. Um, it's interesting that we got all the way through that without my knowing that there is something on the rule, in the rule book in the Congress that should, if it were imposed, create um, the market for this kind of thing. But in any event, the students looked at a single body for both, a single uh, entity for both bodies, something for the House and Senate uniquely, um, a push me, pull you involving uh, the Congress and the executive branch, all of these modalities. And I'm very proud of their work. When I, when I read these things, I concluded that I would be proud uh, to carry their conclusions back into governance, if I ever went. Um, and I'm suggesting that if you want to find a lot of well-presented thinking about how do you operationalize these things, have a look at this body of, um, of, um, of uh, papers. Um, my assistant um, is sitting right at this table. That's Evan Faber. Uh, and I'm about to say something dreadful to him, which is maybe we should think of organizing this stuff um, in a way that makes um, the principal analytic conclusions accessible to people who are now uh, inspired to try to figure out how in the real world you would, um, you would go about uh, creating these institutions. Now, with respect to um, foresight in the executive branch, there are a lot of ways to proceed on a pragmatic basis. 
Um, I believe that the president has a sufficient uh, legal authority to run his own shop pretty much as he sees fit. Um, and when presidents do that, it can result in some pretty dramatic um, um, operations. For example, um, Clinton assigned to Gore the job of um, responding on reinvention of government. Before that was over, there were several hundred people working uh, in the new executive office building across the street from the White House, and they had virtually all been seconded from different parts um, of the administration. There was hardly any new hire to make that system work, and when it had done its job, everybody reverted back to their assignments. Nobody had to go to Congress um, uh, to do this. Now, if you look at the assets that a president has within the White House, there are quite a few. It depends on how he uses his own staff. If you look at how um, the staff of the White House is organized, it's, it's basically organized to help run herd on the, the legacy system of government that we have. Now, what happens if you get it in your head, or the president gets it in his or her head, um, to, to use the White House staff to try to achieve a more networked approach uh, in the executive branch? Well, what are the things it could do? One of the things he could do is use the chief of staff differently um, to try um, to get a more team-like approach in the cabinet. The British cabinet will occasionally organize itself into teams of cabinet-level people who address specific themes or challenges. Our cabinet is a photo op. That's all it is. Okay, But that's not all it could be. All the better because it doesn't exist in the Constitution, and there, are, you know, and there is sort of a feel, free field to design how you would ask your cabinet officers to operate. I only have a few minutes, so I can't start reaching into examples of how this can be done. But it it can be done. It needs to be done. It's sort of silly um, not to be able to meld the resources of government, starting at the secretarial level. Okay, certainly doable but you'd need a system inside the White House to give the president situational knowledge of where the government is going and of how to move it in a certain direction. You could, um, simply by the way in which you populate meetings, dramatically alter um, the way in which information moves around. If, for example, um, you exclude intelligence officers from certain kinds of meetings on policy on the grounds that um, um, they shouldn't be messing around in policy, well, then you're also denying the intelligence community the ability to understand what it is you need in order to formulate and monitor the policy. And so they can hardly be blamed if they're not looking for it or don't find it, and you know, the knowledge that you need is not available in real time, just in, you know, just in time uh, intelligence data. And so simply by making sure that you have been talking um, to intelligence people as participants in governance, you can change the responsiveness of the intelligence community um, and, and in effect teach it to anticipate what is going to be needed by way of its product rather than have it sit around waiting to be told that it was too late uh, to do any good. And I you know I have dealt enough with, with this problem on my own operationally to feel that what I'm saying is, um, is, is correct. So in the first instance, what it boils down to is situational knowledge for the president. Now, one of the things that happened is that um, I, to my astonishment, I discovered that there were some 37 people in the executive branch who um, are known as um, czars. It's a terrible misnomer uh, because the czar is supposed to be someone who has absolute knowledge and absolute power. There are no such things among czars. They have partial knowledge and very limited power. Uh, but they, their presence scattered through the government at least concedes an important point, and that is things are too complex to be ma ma mastered 
uh, by the normal linear or silo-based system, that you need people whose field of vision uh, is lateral and cross-cutting. But the problem with this arrangement is that it is scattered, random, not systematic. So one of the things a president could do um, is try to use this concept of people whose authorities are, are laterally defined um, in a systematic fashion. And let's create a venue for them, have a look at where they are located relative to the president, relative to the cabinet officers, um, and think that corporately uh, this group of people, if they were properly um, situated, would contain among them the body of knowledge that you as president most need, which is a collective awareness of where stuff is going, um, coupled to a sense of timing and pacing. Okay, so that's one way um, to, go, to use the materials in hand, illustratively, um, to achieve a, a better real-time and laterally dispersed sense of what is going on. The other problem is um, how to deal with the longer-term future and with the impact, A, of short-term decisions on that longer-term future, and B, the responsibilities that you have to try to provide for the needs of those who come later um, in the course of the decisions that you make on a short-term basis. How do you visualize and conceptualize that? And that, of course, is the subject that we are, are here to, uh, uh, to talk about. It's the focal point of the recommendations in this uh, book that has been released today. The point I want to make is it is doable. I mean, in the first instance, you have to get beyond the prejudice that says it's too complicated, um, uh, it is not manageable. Uh, it had better be manageable because otherwise, as I tried to point out before, we are going to be overrun and overtaken uh, by events. I mean, our, our destiny as a country is now really um, coupled with the question of can we think long while we, have to, while we are forced to act short so that there is some kind of balance between um, what we do because we must um, and our awareness of what it brings to the, uh, um, uh, to the future. None of this can succeed. Oh, by the way, uh, we now, as you know, the, there are these uh, series of reports. The National Strategy of the United States issued by the President uh, with, you know, under statute, with an X number of days theoretically after taking office. And then there are strategy statements by the Secretary of Defense, the Chairman of the Joint Chiefs of Staff, the Secretary of State, the Director of Central Intelligence, unless it's moved to the ODNI function. Okay. None of these are synchronized. Uh, you would think um, that the President's statement of national strategy by law would be top of the queue. Um, and that the other statements of strategies would be designed by law to fit. And as the Congress would be interested, um, is the, it's the Congress which has demanded this kind of reporting, the Congress should be interested to see the fit and finish of these different visualizations of national strategy inside the context of the President's own statement of what the national strategy is. It would make a great way to create an agenda for oversight. And is a, what has the president said his strategy is and how, Mr. Secretary of Defense or Madam Secretary of State, how do your departmental view actually meld with the national view that has been articulated for us uh, and which is embedded in the administration's request for funding? which leads me to the relationship with the Congress. You can have an executive branch, let's say, which thinks perfectly in these systems. But if it can't communicate them with the Congress, they will go nowhere. Because in the end, the president proposes and the Congress disposes. Now, one of the great problems here is that um, if an administration learns to think and express itself on a programmatic, thematic basis. It's still dealing with a Congress that is ultimately writing a budget on a line-by-line -line, uh, departmental basis. That's a different language. How is it possible um, 
for there to be, even if there is goodwill, um, a communication between an executive branch that speaks this kind of new analytic language holistically, um, whole of governmentally, uh, and a Congress which is still thinking in terms of committee and subcommittee uh, jurisdictions ultimately tied to appropriations. Got to find that methodology, have to find a way to communicate with the Congress on terms that both understand because otherwise the Congress will simply take this wonderful product that we're imagining that the executive will produce and pound it flat um, in order to make it fit the Congress's agenda. Okay, it goes beyond the nastiness of partisan politics and the will to destroy that one sees in partisan politics. And it goes to the question of do they at least speak the same language sometime? And I think um, care has to go in to start looking for what that common language is. Now, one of the things that could happen um, is that Congress could start to clean up its own act. Um, those of who have been around long enough automatically snicker as soon as you hear that. It's in the category of comes the revolution, there will be nothing but peaches and strawberries um, you know, and whipped cream. But from time to time they do it. And one question is, can you not at least um, suggest a way in which the Congress um, can deal with complex pieces of social legislation? Um, and the answer is, yeah, you can. Um, some of the students came up with what they call component, what is it, clip component? Uh, what component level implementation process? And uh, basically what it said is, uh, let's say you have a 20 year objective in mind. In their case, they, uh, given the year they were writing, they took how a conversion of the United States to a hydrogen fuel economy, um, a 20, 25 year process. How do you deal with that in a Congress which is operating on very short cycles and can essentially reverse itself all the time. Answer, at least tentatively, design the thing in chunks, various plateaus, give the Congress um, the opportunity to see what has been done, try to design it around chunks of a, pro of a, a progression that are useful to do in and of themselves even if you don't go any further. And so they looked backwards from a hydrogen economy and said, well, what do you have to do to get there by 2025 or whatever the date was? They analyzed those in physical terms. They then said, well, here's what the money could buy. Um, and then inevitably the Congress is going to have a look at it. So why don't we agree to have a look at it in terms of chunks that we buy? Um, and we evaluate the chunks for their own sake. And also we evaluate whether to continue on towards the larger goal. That was their idea of CLIP. I don't know of any better approach um, uh, to this problem. And I then had them present their ideas to a number of retired legislators who said, yeah, under the existing rules, um, you could break um, things into components. You could lateral them out to committees. And you could reassemble them at the other end. And what's more, we've seen it done. And so again, um, the flexibility to do these things exists in the rules as they are. Um, and so at least one doesn't have to think um, of creating new rules. One has to think only of getting the existing rules used to maximum effect, which is a lesser problem, though a huge one. So um, what, I, what I'm trying to say is we really need to do this. Um, we are in a hole. It's getting deeper. Uh, we are being outthought by our rivals. Um, the margins that we used to have in this country for making mistakes have disappeared. Okay? And so the idea that we can just sort of blunder along, I think, is a luxury that we can't stand anymore. Oh, it really is urgent that we consider how do we plan for the future, because we're the only damn country in the world. The, of, certainly of our stature, that barrels along into the future as if it would take care of itself. While everybody else in the world with whom we compete is out there making sure that the future turns out the way they want it to. That's my definition of a losing game over time. So we need to do it, but the second part of the message is, it is doable. Um, and over the, over the time that I've been working on this, so many conversations that I've started 
have been with people whose opening premise is it's too complex, it's too wide open, even if we concede that you should expand the definition of national security, nobody can handle it. Well, hanging concentrates the mind. This is doable. There are systems to manage it, okay? Um, accept, and the need for it is present. I think that's the starting point um, for change, and I hope it's the end point of our discussions here. Leon has graciously offered to take questions. So if you have any left, now's the time. Yeah, because I'm running out of grace. <laughs> yes, go ahead. What, what troubles me is... That's a bad sign. Yeah. No, I, I agree with the need for the management system, but but the biological analogy that I made earlier, I think is key to designing the strategy for intervention. Um, and it's, I think it's important that people understand the, the push here and it'll poke out their dynamic of complex adaptive systems. And so our strategy for, for evolving these solutions cannot be the typical linear economic based stuff that we that we're that we're sort of especially people who are my age and older who are running the system are accustomed to thinking in terms of no it's it's you know you and I have a long history of discussing these things and and you know that I agree so we got to we got to get into the nitty gritty of the tools that that enable us to do that it matters whether you're using um, an agent-based model or a fitness landscape or, or a network analysis or some of these other gaming tools that, that rely on, um, I don't even know uh, what to just, you know, the, the production function and all that stuff. It matters because they do not, the, the traditional analytical tools do not speak to the dynamics of complex adaptive uh, systems. You're, you're absolutely correct, but I have to revert um, to what I wish had been my native language to express it. Anybody here familiar with the term mishigas? Yes. Okay, it's Yiddish for nuttiness, uh, laced with stupidity. Um, you know, our politics is based on a linear conception of the world, namely that for every problem there's a solution. Um, usually the solution set begins with elect me to office <laughs> and then all else will follow. But the, the premise is my policy, my unique policy identified with me and me alone will solve uniquely this problem and it will go away forever. I'm not sure how we get away from that, uh, but in a serious approach to these problems, one has to recognize following the, the insights that are offered by complexity theory um, that every step we take to solve a problem will move the problem someplace else. That there are no solutions, there is only the responsibility of permanent awareness of what is happening and a permanent effort to adapt um, in a timely way to what needs to be done uh, to deal with it and the knowledge that this is a horse you can never get down from. That's one. Um, two is that these systems um, cannot be looked at um, as if you could twiddle um, one, no one knob and expect predictable changes at the other. Um, what complexity theory teaches you to think about is that everything is simultaneously interactive with everything else. This can drive you nuts, uh, but on the other hand, at least it warns you away uh, from the view that there is a master fix um, which can be identified and then modulated to produce a predictable, proportionate response. All right, I mean, think how much blood and treasure we have sacrificed on the theory that there is a master fix for a big problem um, and only to discover um, that it just leads on to something else much bigger. So. Um, okay, you had a question. Uh, hi, I'm Dan Gibbons, uh, I'm an independent consultant. Uh, you know, I have worked with the project a little bit in a minor role uh, and 
I, I, I have to say, I don't agree with the idea that there is no in unitary configuring vision possible for this system. I think that's what's lacking, actually. In the Cold War, we had a, a vision, a threat we, we identified. We had a, um, uh, we had a, uh, 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 an orientation towards it, a posture towards it, you know, a constitutionally based posture towards what we wanted in vis-a-vis -vis this system, this uh, condition. And we moved forward on those two prongs to, a, I think, a fairly evolutionary successful conclusion. Uh, I think that when we're thinking about restructuring here, I'm not so sure that we, uh, we might be looking at uh, both a, 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 a different environment, but on some levels, a unitary element must be identified in order for us to, to configure to configure this uh, system, uh, institutionalize this system as we're trying to do. In the end, you have to take action. There has to be a plan, um, and people have to be assigned responsibility for what happens if the action doesn't work out the way you, you anticipated. Um, and so from that point of view, I agree that you have to consolidate around a system that people can understand, you can write the rules for it, and so on. What I'm getting at um, is to find an antidote um, for a, a system that was designed for the world that no longer is. Um, we need a system for the world that is becoming. Um, and one of the problems here is you know, when you talk about 21st century government, nobody knows what that is. We're, you know, we're just completed the first decade of the 21st century. How do we know what the second, third, fourth, and nth decades of that century are going to look like? The only things we can say with some certainty is that uh, problems are complex, they're global, but complexity is not an empty term. It's a term with real meaning and it has consequences for the way in which you think about the problems, the way in which you gather and share information about it, the way in which you gather and share information about how the system is handling the problems, and hopefully even the rate at which you, sh you change your approach. Uh, and it also, therefore, does have implications for organization. I mean, governance under these conditions cannot continue to look the way governance has looked to this point. And the question we're really discussing is what um, uh, should be the evolutionary shifts in our government to better enable it to appreciate the possibilities and to recognize the actualities uh, of what is going on than we can presently. Okay, thank you. Okay. Pam? So I will go look at those papers that you recommended from your students, but I, have, I like this idea of chunking, but it's almost a new science in itself because then- I didn't hear the critical word. You like the new the idea? Chunking, the chunking. Chunking. Chunking things up. Right. So in other words, like if we could have a center, let's say, that did a futures approach mm -hmm. and really looked at a, a range of scenarios and came up with a complex adaptive system way of looking at things that looked at the poking and prodding and kind of tr tried to come up with not a single answer, but a family of answers. Then it's almost a science of how do you chunk that back into its pieces. And I think that's an interesting piece of science that I don't think anyone's ever thought about because it's going to make a difference how you chunk it, the temporal part of that. Everything will make a difference if you come all the way back down. It may not come back up into the hole that you thought it was. Yeah, but my, in, in my opinion, the student insight um, that you could break it into units <coughs> such that the units represent a progression towards an objective but such that each unit in and of itself has its own value. So that if, if the Congress decides to trash the program 10 years on into the future, you've got benefit from it. That's, that's something we don't think about doing, but many of the, of the national projects ahead of us actually have very long lead times. I mean, if you go back to the question of energy, when we talk about the need for a smart grid, we're talking about something that will take a very long time 
uh, to create, even if there were not the problem of dealing with 50 state laws concerning the regulation of electric power grids, plus the national laws, plus the existing infrastructure, plus the race of new technologies which make it uncertain which are the best to choose, and so on. Um, you, I mean, what it really boils down to in more elegant language is we have to learn how to legislate on a systems basis. Well, I'm, we a, don't. I'm a Department of Energy complex adaptive system modeler, so you hit the right example there. Right. Because really, that's exactly what we're trying to do in a sense, is saying, trying to envision what it's going to look like in the future, and then trying to figure out with the current situation how we're going to chunk it. I just think it's almost an interesting science to look at that chunking process, and I think that's something maybe some students should be looking well, at. Well, I suggest that you look at it in terms of the legislative cycle as well. Yeah. Um, I mean, there's no way that you can escape the fact that Congress can change its mind, and always does. Right. But maybe um, you can reach agreement um, that we'll buy a chunk. Right. Uh, and then we'll figure out whether we got what we wanted out of that chunk. And are we still of the same mind that we should proceed? Yeah. They do that, after all, let's say, in some forms of defense purchasing. If you're going to buy an aircraft carrier, uh, you can do, I think, five-year funding. Uh, because you're going to have to buy a reactor, lay a keel, do things that can't be accomplished in a short period of time. We'll call it chunk science. I love it. <laughs> I like the idea of becoming a chunk scientist. Be careful you <laughs> yes. Okay. Other questions? Okay. Well, then I think we ought to thank our speaker this afternoon. <laughs> and. Uh, I want to thank Leanne. I, I want to thank all of our speakers and panelists today. Um, I also need to thank some other people. Evan Faber from GW for all of his assistance. Uh, I need to thank, obviously, from PNSR, Jim Locker and Ray Tang, Dale Pfeiffer, Elaine Banner, uh, Richard Weitz uh, for a lot of the support they have given me now for a long, long time. Our host, David Berteau, who was unable to be here today, and Tara Callahan, who's right here from CSIS, who helped us. And of course, our sponsor, Walsh College, and Stephanie Bergeron, my boss, uh, who paid for our lunch today. And, um, and, and finally, I need to thank my core team uh, of the Vision Working Group. Uh, Bob Polk and Dan Langberg, uh, Patty Benner, Elaine Banner, Kaylin Ford, Richard Chasdy, they're all, almost all of them are here today, um, and the task team led by Jim Burke, Chris Wakehoff, and John Maher, and John is also here today, who helped us with those very complex uh, scenario development activities and the National Academies who really stepped up to the plate as well. Um, I think as we develop the steps that will be needed to bring much of these ideas to reality um, and establish, hopefully, uh, something like the center and the capabilities that we've described today, I also hope that we can count on the assistance of many of the people in this room, because you're really the community that we're going to need. I think the world expects the United States to remain a leader. I think we can't do this unless we're strong, and I think our strength is limited if we can't find a mechanism to infuse the foresight capabilities we need in our governance structures. To learn more about our project and keep up to date with our process and our progress, please visit the website at www.pnsr.org. I want to thank you all for coming today and wish you a good afternoon.